John Delacio here. The title of this is The Pastor and the Narcissist. I want to say a big thank you to my Facebook friends and others that have been posting videos or information about the narcissist. Thank you. You helped us discern our situation, what we were going through. All of you that have been or are in or came out of a relationship with a narcissistic type person, share your experiences. It really helped me. It gave me a lot of information and it caused me to look into the subject further on YouTube or other platforms from psychiatrists, doctors and counselors, licensed professional people who understand more about the narcissist than I do. I purposely called it the pastor and the narcissist for this reason. I want to make it very clear, I am a minister of this gospel. I have two honorary doctorates from Bible colleges, but I am not a licensed psychiatrist or whatever that you want to call it. And here's why I'm mentioning this. I saw some of the doctors say that you have to be a licensed legal doctor to be able to diagnose somebody who has this personality disorder. And some of the same ones also say this, it's hard to diagnose because somebody who has that disorder, it, it's, it's, it hides itself. They could be so sweet and innocent one moment, but cunning and queer, it's hard to diagnose this. Well, it might be hard to diagnose this for those legal professional doctors, but not too much for me and you, because we are learned or have learned, unfortunately or fortunately, to experience. So I want to tell you a situation that the people in this room, myself and some other of our friends and church members, the experience we had with a person who I believe because of their actions and because they have the traits and the symptoms, they are a full-fledged narcissist in my opinion. We did send them, by the way, to a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist did not diagnose them with that problem. Here is where my story and our story begins. I'm a pastor. I want to encourage you to watch some videos on my YouTube channel. One of them is called Revival Over the Years with Pastor John. I'll give you a little idea about where we are, who we are, what we're doing. Watch another one called Bigger Bass and Better Doors. Watch and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm telling this story because I'm hoping it helps you. I want, see, we're doing it on a DVD, but I'm going to put it on YouTube and Facebook or any outlet because I want you to share it. My whole purpose of this doing this. I want to help people. I never knew that such a type of person exists. I have a deliverance ministry. I want to expose the works of the enemy. And I did great detailed teachings on Jezebel. You might want to get all my teachings on the Jezebel spirit or Jezebel influence or personality also. And here's why. And I'm going to talk to you and the people in the room also. 
And maybe this is going to help all of us. Did you ever see books on health? Books on health? On eating the right food? Or not eating the wrong food? To help you be healthier. Have you ever seen books or learned anything or teachings on stress? On stress, how it can cause emotional problems and, and not eating right and not doing the right things for your body or things that like smoking or alcohol or drugs and warning you about these things. And stress, they call it the silent killer. I did a very detailed study in the early 80s about stress. And I had a tape set about it also. And I, one doctor had a list of the 10 top things that can cause stress. Another doctor had the top 15 things that can cause stress. America is stressed out. And stress can cause emotional problems. Emotional problems can cause physical problems. You all know where I'm going now? If you are in a relationship with a toxic person, it can affect you physically, spiritually, emotionally, financially, and every area of your life. So these nice people write books or have tapes or CDs or teaching to tell you things you should do and not do to help you with your health. That's exactly what I'm doing. The spirit world is very real. And if you are in a toxic relationship, like we have been in, it can affect you. Now, I, being a minister, have a grace to maybe be more long-suffering and putting up with some things. I'm not really putting up with things. I'm giving people opportunity. I don't like to give up on people. And I believe Jesus didn't give up on me, so I don't want to give up on people. But we have to use discernment. It's a situation where you have a family, and you're a natural family. And you have good children or good siblings and a good family, but you have one toxic person that ruins it for everybody else in the family. And then you have to deal with it because it's not fair to everybody else. I'm one of these preachers that's not afraid to deal with the issue or with the spirit or with the nasty person. And for that reason, somebody would think, well, you're just mean and want to do Jesus is love and God is love. Of course. And that's why you suffer with them that much longer because you are full of godly love and you want to love the person while the whole time they're sneaky and conniving and manipulating. When this person first came into our life, my wife would say, they're so submissive and they're so polite and they seem to be so helpful and kind. And I said, yeah, but everything aren't always what it looks like. Years later, with that same person, my wife would say, I don't want them in our house. I don't trust them. She said, I don't want them around the kids. I don't want them in our house. She was right. She would get frustrated with me because I was being so kind to them and giving them more chances. She was relieved when they left. And now time for the story. In this story, I'm going to tell you some of our experiences because I'm not that doctor or that psychiatrist or that other preacher. 
I'm not going to speak eloquently with the, all the fancy words at all. I'm going to be down to earth. And the easiest way for me to do this is just tell you our experience and then hit on key things that will help you to be able to discern. Here we go. About 13 years prior to this recording, a lady came to meet me and visit me at our church. And she brought a fellow with her who was in his 20s, maybe mid-20s. And she said to me, Pastor John, I used to come to your services what, uh, I ministered a lot. I ministered in over 500 services a year in almost every type of denomination that you can imagine. Morning, noon, and night. How can you preach over 500 services a year with 300 seminars and conferences and several services on Sunday? I did it. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And she used to come to the services and bring her kids. And she said to me, you may not remember him, but when he was younger, I used to bring him to your services when you ministered over in our region. She said to me, we have a problem with him. What's the problem? He lies, he cheats, he steals, and more that I will expound upon. She said, I'll give you an example. We were giving him money. We got him a vehicle. We put gas in it. We put food in his belly. We got him an apartment. We paid for the apartment, my family, and the electric and the utilities so that he can go to college. We all thought he was going to college and we were so proud of him. But it came time for him to graduate and he was not in the graduating class and broke our heart because we found out he never did go to college. His other relatives, his other family are disgusted with him. We're heartbroken. He is a manipulator. And then I find out from him he wasn't going to college. I said, what were you doing? I was playing cards and doing some kind of drug. And he said, I think I'm okay. It's the drugs problem that messed my head up. That was his excuse. He was doing some kind of drug and playing cards every day. His family thought he was going to college. They wanted nothing to do with him now. I says, well, why are you bringing him here? This is what she said. We don't know what to do with him no more. She said, I was praying and God told me, bring him to Pastor John Delacio. He will help him. So she does. She starts coming to the services also for a season. It turns out he has a girlfriend. The girlfriend starts coming also. I said to him, didn't you realize the day was going to come when they found out you were not going to college? Don't you think they're gonna find out? Yeah, that's how he would, yeah. It took a long time to get the year out. I would ask him a question, and it would take me 10 questions to get a answer. He had to manipulate the conversation and drag out the conversation to drain your energy and your time because narcissists are very immature, very poor selfish people, image people, and they want to drain off of your personality and what you have. And they want to control it. And here's what I came to find out. It didn't bother them if they were going to hurt their family. 
because I found out people with this narcissistic type personality, they do not have any empathy. They do not feel sorry. And here's why, what we learned through this. They become part of the church. There's a girlfriend who becomes fiance, want me to take them through marriage counseling. And they told us some things that they wanted to do. So we tried to help them based on what they told us. And here's the problem with Christians. You want so bad to believe people. You want so bad to believe them. And even if you know they're stinkers, you want to be able to trust the Jesus in them if you can't trust them. The problem is, is Jesus really in them? Can a narcissist be a Christian? I believe in name only. They might know about the birth of Jesus, and he died on the cross, and he rose from the dead. They may go to church. They may know all the religious things. But here's what the Bible said. You'll know them by their fruit. I have a hard time understanding how somebody could keep hurting people and manipulating and using people, lying, stealing, cheering, and cheating, whatever, and really be a born-again believer. In my opinion, this person, I'm, I'm, who am I to judge what he's going to do? But according to the fruit, I have serious concerns. So now they become part of the ministry, the mama and the, the girl and the fellow. And we are workers in this ministry. We believe if you're a faith person, you have work to do. Faith always has work to do. So we're on the move and we are doing different things in part of the ministry, trying to advance the ministry because we went through things. The virus really affected us. Losing our lease affected us. Other crazy things affected us. And we were in a time of healing and restoration ourselves. Every single, I hate to tell you, every single, yes, not a few, every single time that we had some kind of a function or activity that we can start to really go ahead, they started to die. Mm -hmm. They would do the dying thing every time. You don't know what to believe. Are they really having the stroke? Ooh! I'm making fun because they were ridiculous. Are they really having a stroke? Are they really having a heart attack? Because that is exactly what this person was trying to get us to believe. It would always happen right at the moment when we had a chance to do some good things and advance the kingdom every single time. I said to the rest of the people, I said, there's something wrong with this person. Don't you find it interesting that every single time we have a chance to do good, he is dying? We sent them to doctor after doctor after doctor, several times to the emergency room. Nobody could really find anything serious wrong with him physically because it was in his head where he wanted it to be. And why would he do these things? Because he had to be the center of attention. The narcissist has to be the center of attention and they don't care who they hurt to get it. No, I'm not a doctor. I learned this from people like you and other doctors. There are a lot of licensed people who know a lot more about this than me, and I would encourage every one of you to learn about it because it is real. It's real. I love the movie Casablanca. 
And I heard one of the psychiatrists on YouTube videos saying that uh, a small percentage of the human race is actually like this. Well, here's what I was thinking. Casablanca. What is the name of the place everybody goes to? Rick's place. Humphrey Bogart playing Rick owned a, a nightclub, a club. I love those, the setting with the white jackets and Sam at the piano and, you know, when people were, you know what I'm trying to say. He had this relationship with a girl in Paris. She left him stranded. He was heartbroken. And one day she walks into his club. He turns around and he sees her and he said it only in a way Humphrey Bogart could say it. He looked at Sam, the piano player, and he said this, with all the joints in the world, she's got to show up at mine. That line resonated with me because when I think about this person and what doctors say, I had to say to myself, with all the churches in the world, he had to show up at mine. It was heartbreaking, but it was also very good. It was an eye-opener for me. I never knew that people could be so nasty. I call it the nasty narcissist. This is going to sound hard to you because me being a preacher and a Christian, I have to admit, I met the most disgusting person that you could ever meet came into my life. I love him. I really do love him. Now, preacher, now listen. Me and these people tried to help that family for 13 years, so don't talk to me about love. I'm trying to help you. Don't judge me now. Otherwise, you're going to miss the blessing that you could get. Not too many of you watching would have did for them that we did in 13 years. I'm going to give you some examples. So, listen to this. They have to be the center of attention. They will ruin every event, whether it's Thanksgiving or Christmas or a funeral or whatever. You can have somebody at a funeral and everybody's at the grave and they'll be dying trying to get the, while the trumpet's blowing. They, there's something very bad wrong with them. Do I feel bad for them? Of course I do. I love them. But I feel more bad for the victims. There is something wrong with preachers there's something wrong with politicians. There's something wrong with people who have more mercy with the nasty person than they do the victim. When you have that kind of off-balance mercy for the, for the transgressor than you do for the victim, you're hurting the victim. Deuteronomy 7 says, have no mercy on the works of the devil. So yes, I love them, but I hate what they're doing. The Bible says I'm supposed to hate the works of the devil, and I do, with a perfect hatred. Because they're hurting people because they're so selfish and self-centered. So by helping you understand this and warning you, maybe it will help you handle the situation in a way that don't make you sick, in a way that doesn't hurt your finances, in a way that doesn't destroy your vision, your dream, your business, your occupation, your church, your ministry. I'm trying to help you, so don't be judgmental right now. I'll give you a little bit more about the center of attention. I took him and his fiancée to a marriage counseling. It was, it has to be in the world's, again, his book, Worlds of Records. It has to be the longest pre-marriage counseling ever. I pre-marriage counseled them for 13 years. 
five times to my memory, I was almost ready to marry them. Every time they were getting ready to have to get married, he would do something to stop the wedding. You know why? She was getting more attention than him, and he didn't care who he heard. The last one went this far. Somebody paid thousands of dollars for the, oh, because they had to have a fancy wedding. They didn't have a pot to pee in, but they had to have a fancy wedding. So somebody and their family paid thousands of dollars for a beautiful venue to have it. Somebody else paying for the food. Somebody else was paying for the photographer. Somebody else was paying for the DJ. And somebody else bought the wedding dress. Or it had to be a fancy one. And somebody else was paying for everything else. All those people did everything they could to provide that they could have a beautiful wedding. And at the last minute, he pulled another stunt and stopped the wedding. He broke his fiance's heart time and time and time again. And she learned nothing from it. She became an enabler. Very sad. And I would say to this person, do you know these people love you? Yes. He would stare at me when I would try to explain things to him. I said, why don't you say, I would yell at him, I would scream at him, I would talk to him, I'd do everything, get you, get some attention. He was enjoying the attention. I says, why don't you say something? And he would say this, I'm processing. Oh, I wanted to introduce him to the fivefold ministry. But we kept trying because first we didn't know were they really having a heart attack? Were they really dying? Were they really having these strokes? Because they were overweight and maybe it could be. Overweight, eating expensive food at somebody else's expense. Four times that I can remember, we got them a place to live. They were there for months and months. The owners of the house were so upset with them, they tried to get them out. It was hard to get them out. First of all, they had 95 big garbage bags full of their dirty clothes dragging them around. Every place we got them to live, in her house, in her house, in his house, and others, they made a mess. They live like pigs. We have a nice person on the camera. We have hurricanes in Florida. And we had a hurricane. We had a brand new truck and I wanted to get it out of the storm. I had a hard time getting it out of the storm because the storm was wider than the state of Florida. And I took it up north trying to run the storm. I couldn't. So finally I said, forget it. I'm going to stay right here and fight the storm. Lo and behold, I was able to get a little dumpy hotel room. The people next to me, they had about 30 people in the room next to me up all night having a hurricane party. 110 mile an hour winds were coming through where we were. The truck was shaking, the place was shaking, and the people next door partying, and they were cooking some kind of food that really stunk terribly. I got phone, my phone starts blowing up. Blowing up, blowing up my phone. I said, who is this? It's in the middle of the morning. His wife texted me, and she said, 
Pastor John, get him out of here. I said, what did your husband do? She says, not my husband. That guy would try to get him out of here. He's a pig. And she listed all the great things. I had a call on a producer here and said, your wife is blowing up my phone. He said, I'll take care of it. That's how bad it was. Everybody tried to help him. And he took advantage of every single one. And in her place, and in his place, and in her place, and the others, never paid a dime rent, never paid a water bill, never paid for the electric, never paid for soap, never paid for anything. You know why? They're entitled to it. They think that you owe them something. When all you're trying to do is be good and help them, and they play on your emotions. It's not my fault it was that drug I was taking. Well, we believe the spirit world is real. For a lot of you watching this, you might not be Christians or whatever. Demons are real, and this person had them. I know how to pray deliverance for people. I would not play, pray deliverance for them. Do you know why? I was too close to the situation, and they wanted me to. They would have enjoyed the attention with me thinking I was going to have a conversation with their demons. It was hard enough having a conversation with them. I'm not trying to be mean. I don't, don't judge me. I want this to help you. If you judge me, you're going to miss the blessing. If you are being more merciful to the person causing the harm than the person, than the victim, you're not doing the victim any justice. It's not fair to the victim. So now we take them to the next step, excuse me. If it's not a heart attack and if it's not a stroke and if it's not this, it's that, maybe it's mental. We sent them to psych. Listen, and all the times we were take, paying them for the doctors, the doctors, the doctors, the emergency room, the psychiatrists, and the, everything else, he didn't pay one dime. Everybody else was paying for it, trying to get him help. When we sent them to psychiatrists, I gave them a list. I said, I want you to show this to the psychiatrist and tell them, we've been trying to help you. We don't know what to do with you anymore. Maybe it's mental. Maybe they can help you. Let them know this is what we've done for you. They showed it to the psychiatrist, who at that time was a woman. And she looked at it. And you know what she said to him, according to him? Wow, this pastor and this church did this for you? They must really love you. She said to him, I don't think you're going to find anybody to help you the way these people did. So now we find out he's, if it's not mental and if it's not physical, the professionals call it a personality disorder. And some of you even want to, some of you are praying for the devil to get saved. The devil ain't going to get saved. And some of you are saying, this is not this person's fault. They were born this way. We believe in something the Bible talks about called born again. If you are really born again, the old man should be dead. And if you're in a church like this for all these years, hearing the word of God, your personality should change. It didn't. So now we send them to get deliverance for people that pray deliverance for people. You know what the deliverance minister said to them? They prayed for a spirit of murder. And listen, they knew nothing about anything and they picked up a spirit of murder. 
And that's why my wife said, I don't want them around the kids and in this house no more. There's something bad wrong with them. And she was right. We screamed, we yelled, we said things that Christians don't say or, no, or that you would think. We fought for them. We got them a place to, we even got them, helped them get a pickup truck. They got in an accident with it. For six months, they were dying. <laughs> because a relative told them they were going to get a lot of money from the accident. <laughs> After they went through three different, you think I'm making fun? I am making fun. You know what? I still have the haughty image of their facial expressions. Their expositionists. I'll talk about that, and they are expositionists. Now watch. What was I saying before I said that? Very haughty, very arrogant. They can't do nothing good. And a little simple thing like tying a knot, had to show them over and over, because they sought the attention like a little child. A 300 pound person w with a baby, spiteful, selfish personality. Yes, I'm being mean to the devil. Oh, I know they're watching. They're very, very nosy. They used to find out everything about everybody else and come and try to tell me. I said, I don't want to hear this. Oh, yeah because they felt they were important to give you information. They always had to make you feel they knew something nobody else knew. Nosy, nosy, nosy. I know you're watching. Get help, please. Get help. And your fiance, shame on you. Shame on you. Well, let me tell you what happened. We did everything we could, and then I said, I can no longer let me tell you, these people on the, these people will tell you in some of the counseling. Well, first of all, let me back up. Let me tell you how we survived it. For every situation, the answer's in this Bible. And for this situation, the scripture says, if somebody offends you, go to them. Maybe you can fix it and you gain a friend, a brother. If that don't work, take a witness. If that don't work, tell it to the church. I was smarter than them because from the very beginning, I felt there's going to be a 50-50 chance this is going to work. And just in case it don't work, I'm going to make sure everybody in my life knows that I and the church did everything we could to help them. I was smarter than them. So after we found out 50-50, I involved these people and others in the counseling sessions on the phone or otherwise. So they all know and we all know that each other knows that every one of us try to do everything we could to help them. And if they don't make it, they're not going to blame the church, they're not going to blame God, and they're not going to blame me. They go look in the mirror. There goes another mirror. So finally, I had to come to the point where I would... Let me tell you how bad it is. I've... Not a doctor. Not a legal... Like I said, I have a couple honorary doctors, but I'm not a psychiatrist or a legal medical doctor. They had me feeling like, what is wrong with me that I can't help this person? I said to my wife and some of the people, I said, I feel like a failure. Now watch this. From the time of this recording, I'm in the ministry the majority of my life. I'm in the ministry. Over 43 years, I'm in full-time ministry. Owned two restaurants. I had cooks, I had busboys, I had waitresses, I had chefs, I had waiters, I had an organ player, I had a singer, I had entertainers. 
I had two sporting goods stores. I had a manager, I had employees. I raced horses, I had grooms, I had caretakers, I had second trainers. I was in the fishing business. I'm in the ministry preaching hundreds of services a year. I'm pastoring this same church since 1988. And I never in my life met anybody like this person. Now it's enough. Now I got a clean heart. These people deserve the medal because they had to put up with me trying to help that family. They had to hear me cry, scream, yell, hurt, get abused. And they had enough faith in God and me that my pastor's trying to do the right thing. But when enough is enough, that's why I'm long-suffering. I know that I'm going to do my best. Once I know that I did everything I can, I am not going to play God in your life. Uh-uh. I will do the man part and let God do the God part. We're coming to a close here. Bear with me. It got to where we couldn't do this no more. It was hurting the rest of us. It was hurting our finances, our emotions, our morale. It was holding us back. It was a hindering spirit. And they were enjoying the attention. And I said, enough. I said to them and to the fiance in front of the others, I said, here's what we're going to do. I can't do this no more. I don't want to give up on you, but from now on, I'm going to talk to you through your fiance. I'm going to talk to you through her, and you could talk to me through her. And I said, one of three things is going to happen. Either you will get free and change, or you will run, or her eyes will be opened up to see what I've been dealing with for 13 years. And you know what he did? He ran and infected her to run also. When she ran, I had a vision of her in quicksand. I just saw on the news at the time of the recording, a man in Alaska got stuck in the mud. It's like quicksand when the thawing out. Got stuck in the mud, sinking in the mud, and the tide came in, and he died. I saw her in that situation. She is in a dangerous place because she saw all the way we tried to help her. She had every family member, father and mother, stepfather, stepmother, his mother and family tell her, get away from him. She saw what we went through and he still was enabling her to do wrong against God, me, and these people that did nothing but try to help her. That's the kind of stronghold that this demon has on people. It's tough. I could say a lot more, watch all my other videos on it. I'm not trying to hurt people, I'm trying to help you. Apparently, people like that don't want to help. If they want to help, we'll be willing to help them if we see they're serious about it. But if they don't want the help, then we have to help the people that do want the help. Do I love them? That was the problem. We loved them so much because they could seem so sweet and so helpful. I mean, they would do one thing and look so nice and break five things. They, everybody thought they were so smart. They knew everything. They knew everything. They know everything. High-minded. Haughty look. I'm telling you, he's out of our life for six months now. I cannot get the images out of my face. I can still see the haughty looks and the prideful look and the dying look and the acting. Uh, terrible. Let me give you an idea about the expositionists. I would tell him, move that table. 
you look around first to see who's watching. If anybody was watching, he would start doing this. He's a big guy. I would look at him in disgust. I said, what, what are you doing? I'm psyching myself up. And then if nobody was looking, he wouldn't do it. You would show him how to do something over and over and over. He would do it right to prove to you that he can. And as soon as you let him go, hey, go back to doing it wrong again because I'm going to do what I want to do the way I want to do it. These are sick people. If you are in a relationship with somebody like that, get help. If you are married to somebody like that, see your pastor, see some psychiatrist, see some professional people, and a lawyer if you have to. Get help. If it's a family member and it's a situation where you cannot whatever, and they're in your life and you're stuck with this, the Bible and a good church will help you survive. But listen, God wants, he's the Prince of Peace. If it's robbing your peace, and if it's robbing your joy, and if it's robbing your finances, it's stopping your business and your church and your job and your ministry and your church, that's the Antichrist spirit. We have to learn how to deal with it in a way that doesn't make us sick and hurt ourselves, because then they and the devil win. Because guess what? They have no empathy. They'll walk away from you, not feel bad one bit. Once they can get everything they can out of you, they don't need you no more. They cannot use you no more. The heck with you. They'll find somebody else. They're parasites. Suck the life out of you. They'll suck the life out of a room. They have to be the center of attention. I mean, help me, help me, help me, help me. Oh, you tell him to do something, he calls his girlfriend. Help me, help me, help me, help me. It's very sick. But I'm trying to help you, and I'm trying to help you be able to help others. Watch every video that you can find on the narcissist. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of information. Now, to tell you the truth, because we had to see if it was a physical thing, it took time. Because we had to see if it was a physical, a spirit, a mental thing, it took time. Because we had to see if it was a spiritual thing, it took time. And once we did everything that we knew what to do and it didn't help, you'll be free when you want to be. But if you don't want to be, you're not going to hurt the rest of us anymore. So if you're in a situation, then it's family or you can't get out or whatever the situation is, we're going to pray that God helps you learn how to deal with it in a way that doesn't hurt everything else that God wants you to do. They have no empathy. One more time, I would say to them, do you know these people love you? Yes. Do you know how much they helped you? Yes. Can I ask you a question? Yes. How can you keep let, hurting people that love you and helping you and not even feel bad about it? That's what used to bug me. How could you keep hurt? Uh, I said you have no compassion. You don't have to be saved to have compassion. You have no compassion. You can hurt people and not feel bad about it because you think, now I'm going to close with this now. And here's when it got to the bottom line with us. I'm an exhorter. In the beginning, I would have to be very concerned about this particular person's personal hygiene. They would wear the same stupid sh knickerbocker shorts or whatever every day to, to come the same shirt, 
The beard would get gold and ugly. The hair would do the same. Their breath would stink. I would have to tell them, go take a shower. We have a lady in the church, her husband's a barber. Go see him, get a haircut. If you want to have a beard, be a groom. You're a representative of Christ in this ministry. Look it. I can go on and on, but I don't want you to think that I'm mean because I want, don't want you to sit down on me. But I'll end with this. I'm an exhorter. And after a while, every once in a while, I would try to encourage them. And I would say, you, you came a long ways. Even though I knew they had a long ways to go, I would say, well, you came a long ways. You overcame. You, how? I says, well, you're not doing this no more and that anymore and this. And they would look at me like, and they said, that never happened. I said, oh, my God. They are delusional. They are in denial. They don't have any idea of the good that we did for them. So I said to them, I want you to text me. Not now. I want you to go and pray and think and text. I said, you could even ask your... No, I said to his fiance, I don't want you to help her with this because she was a real enabler. He would go, Ooh. and then she would hug him and love him. Well, you poor thing, you, or they're being mean to you. She's going to find out. I said to him, I want you to go home and pray and think. I want you to text me five things that you think God, me, and this church helped you. Do you know he could not think of one? He could not text me one thing that he would give credit to God and me and this church. Not one. And when I said all that, I said, this is over. God's getting no glory. He's taking advantage of the people in this ministry. From now on, I'm going to talk to you through your fiance. So I pray for you right now. For whatever reason you're watching, there could be many. I'm not a licensed psychiatrist or doctor. I'm old enough to be many of you's grandfathers or father. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. I've been in full-time ministry the majority of my life, and I'm not done yet. I've owned restaurants. I owned fishing business. I owned racehorses. I had a lot of employees. I'm pastoring the same church since 1988. I preached in many different other churches. I've never met anybody so disgusting in my life. They are dangerous, and they think you owe them something. It is reverse psychology. And it is a reverse sense of insecurity and a reverse sense of having a very bad self-image. And they have to drain off of the good in you to make themselves feel better. Watch all my videos. And I want to say this one more time. There's a lot of people that know more about the subject than I do. So seek help. Learn everything you can about it. Help is available to you if you want it. You are, whether you are a Christian or not, whatever your belief is, you were made in the image and likeness of God. You were created. For God wants you blessed. He wants you to have life and more abundantly. Whatever you are, a Christian or not, you are not a doormat. You're a child of God. You're a king's kid. We need to live like it and act like it. And if those kind of people don't want it, don't let them hurt the rest of the people in your life. Make a stand against what is wrong and do the right thing. And do not show more mercy to the criminal than to the victim. That is very unfair to the victim when people do that. I love you. We're out of time. On your screen, there wasn't much information on the screen because we wanted your heart. But we're going to go out inviting you 
to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Pastor John Delisio. If you're a friend, you can send me a friend on Facebook. I think I only allowed 5,000, so I'm just about full. But you can subscribe to my public figure pages on Heartland Christian Center or Pastor John Delisio. If you want to be on our email mailing list so you can know where we're ministering or what we're ministering or more information, there's the email address. We came to you for this purpose, to share our experience with you. Hopefully it will help you and help others. I want you to share this with everybody you can. If you know anybody in a toxic relationship, love them enough to warn them. If they don't take the warning, the blood's off of your hands and it's their problem. But at least you could go to sleep at night knowing I tried to help them, I did it. See, we're clean. Because we did everything biblical, scriptural, we did it unto the Lord. And here's the good part. Once the person left our life, it's like the windows of heaven open and God's pouring blessings on us because the Jonah's off the boat. That's another teaching. We're out of time. I hope you heard my heart. I, I'm, I'm very sincere about this. Very sincere. I met the most disgusting person that you can imagine. And they seemed sweet while they were evil. And if you're watching, you know what I'm talking about. You know who I'm talking to. You know I'm right. Get help. We love you. All right. Say amen.